Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Claire Erickson, and I just finished my PhD in neuroscience here at UW through the Neuroscience and Public Policy Program. I'm originally from Mundelein, Illinois, uh, but recently all of my immediate family has moved to Wisconsin, so we're all Badgers here now. <laughs> During the month of June, Badger Talks Live is proud to showcase the latest UW research and information in support of Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Sterling Johnson, uh, my advisor for my PhD. Today, he's going to share the latest discoveries made from the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, which is known as RAP, which is one of the largest and longest running studies of individuals at risk for Alzheimer's disease, which he leads. He will also address brain and eventual cognitive changes that occur prior to the dementia phase of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Johnson is a clinical neuropsychologist with research interests in early identification of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. His current research focuses on tau and amyloid imaging and people at risk for Alzheimer's disease, developing better methods for identifying cognitive decline, computer vision and machine learning based multimodal imaging markers of Alzheimer's disease, and enriching clinical trials and improving trial design to speed the discovery of effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from Brigham Young University. Sterling will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to post them in the chat at any point. Please welcome Dr. Sterling Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Claire. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, I'm really excited to talk today about the RAP study, the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, which is um, now past its 20th year of existence. This study was started by my colleague and, and friend, Dr. Mark Sager, uh, whose vision um, really put this whole thing in, into place. And I was fortunate to take on this study back in 2014 I'd been working with the study since 2002, but um, it took over the leadership of the study in 2014. And I'm just excited about where it is, and I'm excited about the findings we have, and I'm looking forward to presenting those here today. Let's uh, go on to the next slide. Okay, here we are. So just first of all, let's all get on the same page about what Alzheimer's disease is. I'm abbreviating it sometimes as AD. AD stands for Alzheimer's disease. And it's defined um, biologically by the two proteins that are involved. One is called amyloid beta and the other is called tau. And these proteins, they, they um, aggregate or they clump together in the brain and they really cause havoc for the, the brain's cells and they uh, make it so the brain cells don't function like they used to. And eventually, after so many uh, cells lose their uh, functionality and, and die off, eventually those symptoms of Alzheimer's start. And that's typically what we think about when we think about Alzheimer's is the symptomatic stage of mild impairment and dementia. But I, what I want to show you today is that this, this disease starts 20 or more years before those symptoms ever appear. And it has a prolonged pre-symptomatic stage that doesn't always progress to symptoms, or at least not while the, uh, while the person uh, is alive. And, uh, and so they may get to the point where they die, die of something else and their symptoms never do progress. The very exciting thing that I want to um, bring to your attention today is that we have tools, we have um, techniques that help us understand whether or not Alzheimer's is present. This is so important because there's other diseases that can co-occur or that can mimic and imitate Alzheimer's disease. And uh, with these biomarkers and MRI uh, and spinal fluid and PET studies, which I'll explain to you, we think we're getting more clarity on who has AD and who doesn't, and when we can identify it, and the predictive value of those things. This is so important because in the US alone, there's 5.8 million of us that have Alzheimer's disease right now, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And this is a fairly rough estimate because we haven't had the kind of biomarkers I'll be talking to you about 
uh, for the, the statisticians who made this estimate, it was mainly based on a clinical diagnosis, which we know is not often accurate. <laughs> All right, so let me try to say what I just said in, in some pictures. First, we got the amyloid plaques. And then after a period of time, these tau tangles appear. And after a period of time, those plaques and tangles uh, bother the cells enough that cells become dysfunctional and they eventually die. And that is what causes the symptoms. First, mild symptoms, and then progressively more symptoms to the point where it's dementia. And dementia is that umbrella term that defines when a person has lost enough cognitive function that they're no longer capable of doing the things they used to do and functioning effectively in their world and they need assistance and it continues to progress. This whole process of the start of the proteins to the point where dementia is present takes anywhere from 10 to 25 years. And this is what we call the preclinical window. Well, um, we used to be able to only identify this disease after a person had passed away. And in life, it was our best clinical estimation. Now with these biomarkers, which I'm showing you some examples of here, we can, we can see this disease up close. And um, what the neuropathologists would look at are these slides in the middle, the, the plaques and the, and the neurofibrillary tangles. We have imaging for amyloid plaques here on the left and imaging for tau tangles here on the right. And these things are really helping us understand the disease way earlier than we ever could before, certainly before a person passes away. Here's an example of how this works. We have two patients here. They both have mild memory symptoms. As you can see, the one on the left has a signal on their PET scans. The top one is their amyloid PET scan for these amyloid proteins. The bottom one is the tau scan for their tau proteins, which, which forms tangles. You can see that in red. And um, the participant on the right, participant number two, is negative for both amyloid and tau, meaning that they don't have these proteins in their brain. And this is often how very clear this can be um, with these kinds of biomarkers. You see that there's a profound difference between these two people on the same kind of PET scan. One has the proteins, the other doesn't. And that's why you see these differences. Well, um, what I'll be talking to you today about is how we can use these things. And we call um, amyloid, we sometimes abbreviate that as A, A for amyloid, and T it stands for tau. And you can be plus or minus on these things, plus meaning you're amyloid positive or tau positive. And, um, and the minus sign for, for being negative on these things. And so these mean different things and they help us uh, profile a person's biomarker um, pattern to, um, to tell us something meaningful about the disease. And we identify the syndromes or the staging of cognitive impairment on a separate scale from unimpaired to mild impairment to dementia. All right, well, let me, with that background, um, I think we can now talk about the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, which is, as I said, in its uh, um, 20th year, 21st year now, our main goals are, are to, to identify Alzheimer's disease before the symptoms ever appear, and to identify the genetic and the health and lifestyle factors that might slow it down or even help us uh, get insight into what would prevent this disease. Before I get into the science, I wanna um, explain how we approach science and people. We couldn't do this research without partnering with the, with the community, with volunteers. And our whole purpose and how we interact with our volunteers who are so generous with their time is that uh, we, we want to do this such that we can discover and share knowledge on how to prevent this disease, to empower all communities to prevent this disease. And why us? It's because we have, uh, we have the incredible resources of the University of Wisconsin, the imaging, the technology, but also this incredibly large and committed cohort of people 
who um, are at higher risk for this disease. And I'll talk about that. And these are our core values of how we go about doing this scientific discovery in a way that's generalizable to all communities, respectful engagement with our participants, high quality research data that is easy to access and share so that people throughout the world can use our data to make discoveries. And we want to do this so that we can improve the brain health of our participants and the communities that they come from. All right, well, let me talk more about the RAP study. This is part of our Alzheimer's program here at the UW. It's, it's a sister study with our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, RAP itself is based in the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. And together the Institute and the, and the ADRC, the Research Center, is our educational and outreach arm and our scientific arm of our program. And we, we're all the same people in these different institutes and centers and we work together and we are working to um, make new discoveries and also disseminate those discoveries throughout the, the communities and, and the state and beyond. Okay, what is RAP? It's a longitudinal study that so far has about 1,725 people in the study, about 1,250 are active. They enrolled at a mean age of 54, baseline age. And on average, there's about 12 years of follow-up. Most of them have a parent who had Alzheimer's disease and 73% uh, had a parent. Some of them have a risk factor gene called APOE that we can talk about. And the other thing about RAP is that it's also a registry for many, many linked studies with our Alzheimer's program. And so it's both a, a, an observational longitudinal study in and of itself and a registry for other linked studies to piggyback on RAP. Here's where our participants come from. As you can see, most of them are here in the state of Wisconsin, but they can be uh, some of them have spread out to other states and many of them come back every two years for the testing that we like to do and they sign up for the imaging and other biomarker studies that we like to do. Um, the average age of our participants is about 67. 70% are women, 73% have a family history. And there's some other demographic and health characteristics here. Many at this age have um, obesity uh, or high cholesterol or high blood pressure, 40% of high blood pressure. And so these are fairly typical of this age range of being in a, a person's late 60s and early 70s. Okay, what have we discovered? What's been our impact? I wanna talk about a couple things today. And uh, uh, here's the three things that I think have been our main discoveries of late. One is that we've determined the age that Alzheimer's disease starts from these brain scans that I mentioned to you earlier. The second is that we can identify subtle cognitive change. And I won't spend a lot of time on this today, uh, but just so you know, we can identify subtle change in a person well before they reach an impairment zone. And the thing that we're trying to do with these two discoveries is understand how health and lifestyle factors might slow down cognitive decline. In our frontier, what we want to do next is expand the, uh, use the information we're collecting to expand that interval between when the disease starts, the proteins start, and when cognitive decline happens. Okay, well, let me go to some of our um, discoveries and some of the science that we've done in the past few years. And I'll start with this one from 2020, uh, which is now uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is from Dr. Toby Bethauser, who did this work when he was a uh, postdoctoral um, uh, scholar with us. And uh, in this study, we asked the question, um, does amyloid and tau, does, does it in, impact cognitive decline? And we, we put people in groups of whether they were amyloid positive or negative and tau positive or negative. And we wanted to see how that impacted their cognitive change over time. And um, so here's what we found. As you can see here, there's four different groupings 
one group up there on the upper left is amyloid negative but tau positive. There's very few people in this camp um, because tau doesn't usually occur without amyloid. And then going uh, counterclockwise to that gray square in the lower left, that group is amyloid negative and tau negative. These are the people who don't have any protein evidence of Alzheimer's disease. And then the bottom right, the amyloid plus tau negative group is uh, in blue. And uh, so they have one of the proteins, but not both. And finally, the group that has both proteins in red up in the upper right. And um, uh, so these are the people who have the definition of Alzheimer's disease, even though they didn't have any symptoms when they started. And what you can see from that group in red that you don't see in these other groupings is that their cognition, which is what we're, what we're seeing here is these cognitive change over time or age, cognition is changing kind of like a waterfall almost in that upper right group and that red group. Whereas in the other groups, uh, it's more uh, fluctuating and somewhat random in the, in the gray group even. Uh, and we all have good days and bad days cognitively. And so we want to see and we, we expect to see some fluctuation from uh, time to time. But that group in red, you can see that even with a little bit of fluctuation, there's some unambiguous cognitive decline that is occurring in people who have Alzheimer proteins in their brain. And again, this is well before symptoms. And this is borne out by doing the, the formal statistics that group in red declined three times faster than the other groups. So that is the first major insight I want you to learn from this presentation, is that if you have these proteins, you will be declining from midlife. And uh, that's, that's important to, to know. Um, this group had marginally more hippocampal volume loss, which is a, is a structure that is important for memory. They didn't really have any differences in their weight or their cholesterol or blood pressure from the other groups. So that suggests that those factors are not a factor in, in their uh, Alzheimer's course. And, um, uh, but we wanted to go beyond this study to see if we could learn more than we could from just binarizing someone into plus or minus, into having proteins or not having proteins. There's probably more information that could be had there about how much protein is, is present and uh, can we learn something from that? And so that's what I'm gonna show you next here. This is a study that was spearheaded by Dr. Rebecca Kosick, who is one of our uh, senior scientists with the RAP study. And we published this in 2020 as well. And here we show that, um, uh, well, I, let me just show you these, these graphs in the, on the left side. On the far left, you just see the unadjusted amyloid scans and each dot is, is a summary measure of a person's amyloid scan and each person is a line. And if they only had one observation, then they're just a dot without a line. But what you see there is that those red um, individuals who are above the dotted threshold line for being positive, they're increasing in their amyloid at the same rate. What differs is the age at which they became amyloid positive. And this uh, inspired us to create some algorithms to actually uh, line everybody up based on when we think they became positive. And this in turn allowed us to estimate the age at which a person became positive. And with that information, one can then estimate how long a person has had this disease at any point in time. And it's, that's a pretty remarkable transformation to go from a, an amyloid score to a temporal measure like age of onset and, and, and duration of disease. Well, after we published that, we, um, our colleagues at WashU down in St. Louis published something very similar. So that's a good sign that we've replicated our work. Our colleagues over at Mayo Clinic in Rochester have replicated uh, this finding as well. Um, we saw in the literature that we weren't the first to do this. In fact, our colleagues at the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging were the first to discover this idea. 
um, and we've shown their data here in the upper, in upper right. And then the large public um, data set called ADNI, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, we see the same thing there that you can transform these raw amyloid values to a time scale and we can get an idea of when a person became amyloid positive and how long they've had the disease. Well, how can we make use of this? Let me show you how we can make use of this. This is a 74 year old woman when she had her last PET scan. And you can see her PET scan here in the upper um, middle where she was at age 65 when she had mild cognitive impairment. Now she has dementia and you can see more amyloid in her brain. But when we put her on our temporal modeling profile, she's about here. She's about 20 years, 21 years, actually 23 years into her disease. We estimate that she became positive for amyloid at age 51. This is many years before we even began studying her. And uh, that's the power of these algorithms is that they can really tell us how far back in time this disease started. Well, um, how does this predict the future? We, we just talked about you know, estimating their, their prior onset age, but what about their future? I've plotted here with the help of Alex Birdsill, who was a postdoc here and now a professor at Tulane. Uh, Alex plotted the amyloid years on the x-axis for a bunch of people and their clinical symptoms on the y-axis here. And you can see that on average, which is the blue trend line, people reach this very mild impairment zone or mild impairment zone, I should say, about 24 to 25 years after they first started having amyloid in their brain. So this is the evidence that says it takes 20 or more years to become symptomatic, but that's too simple of a, a message. There's certainly people well after 20 years who don't yet have symptoms, but there's a whole bunch of people who reach symptoms at um, uh, eight or 10 or, or 15 years after becoming amyloid positive. And when we looked at these people here who reached symptoms earlier, we found that they were older to begin with and also that they had more vascular disease happening in their brain. So this tells us that uh, when, you, when a person has more than Alzheimer's disease, um, they may be changing faster than people who uh, have Alzheimer's only in their brain. Okay, so that was another insight to take home from this. Now, the third insight I want you to know about is from, from this slide. And this is plotting amyloid in time, again, amyloid chronicity, versus the amount of tau that a person has in their brain. And what I've circled here is this big empty space. And this is spanning roughly 20 years and beyond, where we only have two people in here. So there's two people that have amyloid here, but they don't yet have tau. Everybody else has developed tau by this point. So um, this is uh, an important insight that the longer you've had amyloid in your brain, the more likely you are to also have tau. So these two proteins are a little asynchronous. You can, you can think of it as, as they, they don't start at the same time. Tau can occur at any time along the amyloid continuum. We don't know why that is. Having tau by itself without amyloid is extraordinarily rare. It happens only three to 4% of the time. All right, well, that's um, really so insightful for us. And we've developed a lot of questions from, from those plots that I just showed you that are fueling, I hope, the next five years of the RAP study. But we're, we, I haven't talked yet about lifestyle and health factors. And you see these things in the media all the time, does hypertension influence Alzheimer's? Does the amount of sleep you get or the kind of coffee you drink or how much physical activity you have or your neighborhood or your stress level or your diet, all of these things have been purported in the media and in some of our scientific journals to influence Alzheimer's disease. And so we wanted to know, does do any of these things slow it down or not? And we used an index called the Lifestyle for Brain Health Index, which allows us to take 
a bunch of these things on our on those lists like alcohol use, cardiovascular disease, physical activity, kidney disease, diabetes, cholesterol, all of these things and, and create a score for them called the Libra Index, Lifestyle for Brain Health Index. And what we found is that indeed, if you have an unhealthy um, lifestyle index, cognition is uh, not gonna be as strong. And in fact, those people tend to reach impairment a little earlier in life. And that's what these curves show us. But what we didn't find is an association with amyloid. And so um, it's having these lifestyle and health factors are having an effect on cognition that is not really happening through Alzheimer's disease. It has some other general effect on cognition. Well, um, I'll just end this section by um, taking a little sidebar of five ways of promoting brain health. This may not necessarily slow down Alzheimer proteins, but it'll certainly keep you cognitively healthy, healthier for longer. And we can break these five things up into two, um, two general sets. The one first thing to do is to see your doctor and talk about your blood pressure, your cholesterol, uh, whether, you're, whether you have diabetes and uh, reducing your risk through um, lowering your weight in many cases, um, stopping to smoke if you're smoking, um, treating any depression or mood or other um, anxiety related or, or uh, depression related things that are going on in your life. And then on a daily basis, what we can do without the help of our doctor usually is um, make, make sure we're exercising regularly, making sleep a priority, uh, having a good diet, something like the Mediterranean diet. Um, I'm not saying this is definitely the diet to do, but a diet like this that favors whole foods and good foods over processed sugary foods is, um, is a good way to go. And challenging your brain cognitively with activities that you like to do. These are all ways of helping our brains stay healthy. I don't think they're gonna slow down Alzheimer proteins but they do protect brain cells and vessels. They promote blood flow. They promote cell growth and complexity and hormonal balance in our brains. Let me um, finish the uh, scientific segment of this by talking to you about the future, which is in blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. And um, 10 years ago, if you had asked me if, if we can learn anything meaningful from blood, I would have been fairly skeptical, but we and um, many other groups are now starting to show that there's really important signal in our blood related to Alzheimer's disease. So here's an example. We took 173, 173 people from RAP who had uh, blood samples in the freezer and together they had about, um, oh, close to uh, three samples each. So uh, close to 500 samples here and some of them, 44% were amyloid positive, and you know what that means now. They had an amyloid uh, positive PET scan, and 56% didn't have any amyloid in their brain. The age at the first blood draw was age 63, and the age at their last blood draw was age 68. And we asked the question, does these blood markers, one of them being PTAU217, which is the name of a protein that we can see in blood, does it change over time in people who have amyloid or PIB stands for amyloid in their brain? And is it, does it match up with the PET scans and does it affect cognitive change over time? So um, my colleague, Aaron Genitis, who's our, one of our statisticians with a study uh, ran all of this. And this was a collaboration with colleagues in Sweden at Lund University, Oscar Hansen and his uh, lab at, uh, Lund University. Here's what we found, that the longer you've had amyloid in your brain based on our gold standard PET scans, the higher this blood marker tended to be. And it was especially high in the people who also had evidence, again, on their PET scans of tau proteins. So now we have a, a blood marker telling us pretty much exactly what the PET scans are telling us. And um, this paper 
by the way, is available for you to read if you want. It's on MedArchive. Uh, if you Google genitis and MedArchive, you'll probably land on this paper, depending on when you see this. Uh, just to show you what um, how this does agree with the PET scans, uh, these are called ROC or receiver operating curves. Um, and we see very high agreement between the blood test and the gold standard PET scans. And um, this is, this is ex extraordinarily encouraging uh, early findings. I'll emphasize that it's an early finding in the study um, that needs to be replicated in an even bigger sample. But it is very characteristic of what we're finding as a field these days. And I'm excited and encouraged by it. What about cognition? Uh, the blood marker at age 63 did indeed predict a later cognitive change. And the people with low values in, the, in their blood, uh, which are in blue, didn't change all that much cognitively over time. But the people who um, had high levels in their blood of this PTAU 217 marker, they were changing quite a bit on their cognitive measurement over time. And that is reflected here in this orange uh, color. This is remarkable because most of these individuals were unimpaired at the time of that first blood draw at age 63. All right, well, what about um, other communities? Um, we have looked at a different marker called amyloid, a beta 42 to 40. It's a ratio of amyloid uh, proteins that you can detect in blood. And we looked at 179 uh, African-Americans who are part of our program, both in RAP and in the sister cohort, the Alzheimer's Research Center. And the first uh, blood draw here was at age 66 on average. And what we're seeing here is that the people with the more harmful levels in the, in the lowest 10th percentile of amyloid, those are the people who are taking longer to do certain tests and having um, worse performance over time on their memory tests. And this uh, very much corroborates what I just showed you with that PTAU 217 result. And this result is, is specific to African-Americans and it shows that we're seeing the same thing here in this community that we see in the majority community. And um, that again is very encouraging and it suggests that these markers will be useful in the kinds of communities that are gonna be meaningful to study. Well, what is next with these blood markers? Um, we know that these proteins are detectable in the blood. We think that a blood test is gonna be in the future for this disease, and this will greatly accelerate discoveries, and it will help doctors advise patients and diagnose patients and even treat their patients because they can use levels in the blood as a potential outcome and to know if their treatment is, is effective or not. But there's a lot of unanswered questions that we still need to do research on to really deploy these blood markers in a, in a routine way. And one is to know how much amyloid and protein, how much amyloid and tau protein in the blood is abnormal? And what should that threshold B, and is that threshold the same for all communities? These are things we're working on. What do we mean by abnormal? Um, can we predict cognitive decline? Are the results generalizable? Uh, in order to answer these kinds of questions, we need people in the study uh, who are willing to do that blood sample and also who are willing to undergo a test like these blood, these uh, PET scans so that we can get the gold standard and then compare that to the blood test in the same individual. This is work we're doing now. It's a uh, work that we have ongoing in the RAP study and we're very excited about um, where it's gonna go next. Well, um, let me show you one more result here and then we'll, we'll kind of sum it up. Um, the context here is that this disease can start anytime in midlife or beyond. And I'm showing you results now from Dr. Bedhauser's most, most recent paper, um, 
which is now uh, in press in the journal Brain. And um, what we found here, or what we've, what we've plotted here is the amyloid onset age. So this is age on the y-axis, and these dots are um, the ages at which people in the study uh, were observed to have, uh, or were estimated to be become amyloid positive. You can see that the age of onset, the youngest age of onset was around age 40. The oldest age of onset was about age 95, 96 ish. And this says that this disease, no matter your genetic background, this disease can happen at any time from midlife and beyond. And we really do need a blood test to detect this. It's not enough to have these PET scans and have a positive or negative on the PET scan. We need to know how much is there. And we need to know um, when it started. These PET scans are probably a little too um, unwieldy to, to do on a population basis. A blood test would be so much better. So we're excited about where this re research is going to go. To summarize, uh, AD, Alzheimer's disease, is detectable years before its symptoms with these biomarkers. The, pe the people who have amyloid and tau proteins uh, in their brain have been declining from midlife and uh, that because they are the people who have the disease and they're the ones who will likely, in my opinion, they're the ones who will be getting dementia in their 60s and 70s and, and so on. Uh, amyloid onset varies widely, as I just mentioned, from 40 to 90, but it's estimable. If you have the APOE gene, you have a higher likelihood of getting amyloid earlier in life. The temporal information that we can get from PET scans is remarkable. Can we get the same temporal information about age of onset and disease duration from a single blood test? We hope so. We think it might be possible. Um, amyloid in the brain happens slowly and predictably, but it's not really benign. The longer you've had it, the more likely you are to develop the other protein, tau, and also to develop cognitive change, cognitive decline. Um, finally, um, the lifestyle and health factors do seem to influence cognitive change. They don't seem to influence the amyloid protein itself. Uh, we're still investigating this, and we'll have more uh, to come on this in the near future. And we're excited to really scale up the kind of investigations that we can do through the use of these blood biomarkers. Well, what is next uh, for our field? Just in the big picture, what's happening is that there are clinical trials that are very encouraging. These clinical trials are using drugs that um, remove amyloid very effectively from the brain and people who have amyloid proteins in their brain. The new class of drugs that are being investigated these days pull that amyloid out. The question that the pharmaceuticals uh, companies and researchers need to figure out is when is the best time to give those drugs? And uh, that is what we're working on now. Finally, if, uh, if there's people watching today or uh, people watching um, who, who have symptoms or who have a loved one with symptoms that might be Alzheimer's disease. If you're in Wisconsin, you can go to uh, any of our clinics throughout the state through the WAI clinic network, the Alzheimer's Institute clinic network, which are at these starred locations. You can um, identify clinics that are affiliated with our with the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute at our website, wai.wisc.edu. And again, this is for people who may be having symptoms or are concerned about someone with symptoms. And finally, for more information on the latest science of this disease as it's happening, you can sign up for the Dementia Matters podcast, which is a, um, a well-listened to podcast that uh, covers this whole field and it translates the science into accessible uh, conversation. It's hosted by our very own uh, Nate Chin, who's a geriatrician with UW and the medical director for the RAP study and also the ADRC study. And uh, there's ways to listen to that, which are, are listed here.
So with all of that, let me thank you for being here today uh, and listening to this, if you've made it this far, and also acknowledge the many people who've made all of this possible, especially uh, the participants who are volunteers who have generously donated their time to making these studies a success. Sterling. And also, yeah, thank you. Go yeah, ahead. I was just going to say thanks so much uh, for sharing all of this important information. And we have a, a large group of people tuning in today, which really indicates the need for the importance of all this information being shared with people because it affects so many families. Um, so let's see, where do I start? Um, does Medicare cover PET scans? Is that in your wheelhouse at all? Um, or where would people go to find that? Yeah, it's it's um, peripherally in my wheelhouse. And the answer is it really does not cover PET scans. Those would need to be paid for out of pocket at this point. I think once we get a, a, a drug that is clinically approved and useful, um, that Medicare will need to start covering PET scans. But right now they don't. They just covered in, in a, a small number of research studies, but not in broad use. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, we have another question. Oh, this is a comment. This is amazing material. Um, another comment, many thanks for sharing the findings, which is useful. I must work on the five ways to improve brain health. And I always find these Badger Talks very interesting and easy to follow. Thank you, Yam, that's very kind. Uh, this, uh, somebody commented wanting to know if the talk will stay on Facebook and yes, just so you know, it will live out here on the Badger Talks Facebook page and it will also be on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to share and come back and listen again. Um, the same question on the PET scan, uh, do, uh, uh, another question around that, do you know a typical cost on that or maybe they'd need to reach out to their healthcare provider? It will, it will vary from um, healthcare system to healthcare system, and also whether or not um, there's any the, the, the companies that that are actually able to do these PET scans have any incentives uh, available at, at the hospitals. But in general, out of pocket, they're roughly five or six thousand dollars. They're not cheap, so it's not really a way that that we want people to spend their money right now. Um, we know that these blood tests will be coming down the, the line very soon. And I think that we'll, they'll be good enough and uh, close enough to the PET scans that we'll have something very promising with a blood draw in, uh, I don't know how long it'll take, a year or 18 months, we'll have good tests for those, I think. Oh, that's very exciting news. Uh, okay, another question. Um, what is lumbar puncture and do you share your findings with participants? And if so, when? That's a really great question. I didn't have time to cover all of that, but a lumbar puncture is how we get um, spinal fluid out of a person's back. Spinal fluid is also called cerebral spinal fluid. It bathes the brain and is produced in the brain. And it has these proteins in it, the amyloid, and pla the amyloid plaque protein the tau protein. So um, we get at it with a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap is how we, you know, we would used to say it. This is a way of getting in a reasonably painless way. Um, it doesn't sound painless, but it is. Um, we can get these um, protein levels and use that for research on amyloid and tau and many, many other proteins, four or 500 other proteins in the spinal fluid can help us understand this disease and several other diseases that may be co-occurring or causing a person's symptoms. It's an important uh, area of research for us. Yeah, and the second part of that question was, do you share your findings with the participant? And if so, when? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we don't share the findings of the lumbar puncture, but we do share the findings depending on um, the particulars of the study that a person is signing up for, we can share the findings of the amyloid PET scan result with our participants. And so we can tell them if they have amyloid proteins in their brain or not. This is a very new development for us, and we're excited to be able to 
share this with participants because we think it is meaningful information as you saw. Uh, it does predict decline and we think that's important for participants to know about. Excellent, thank you. It's the you... first time I'm, pre I'm actually announcing that publicly. <laughs> That well, that's to... exciting. Right here on Badger Talks Live. I love that's it. Um, so uh, you did address this, but maybe if you wouldn't mind just summing this up. Uh, so to what extent perhaps you covered this, which you did, is genetics playing in? If my paternal aunt passed because of early onset Alzheimer's, should I be particularly engaged? Early onset Alzheimer's disease um, can mean many different things. There's a form of this that is um, strongly genetically based and it runs in families and the onset age in those families, it's very rare, but the onset age is in a person's forties or early fifties. And um, so that's something to, if you're experiencing symptoms and you've got a family history of early onset, it's, it's worth, um, keeping track of your cognitive change and um, staying in touch with your doctor on those things. In general though, for the, for the most of us, for Alzheimer's disease, the APOE gene is the major culprit. It, it accounts for about 90% of our genetic susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease, but it's just a risk factor gene for most of us. Um, this gene is always a risk factor gene, but uh, um, it's, What's, what happens is that if you have the um, bad form of this gene, the E4 allele, um, you're likely to have amyloid in your brain. The important thing about genetics and Alzheimer's, uh, at least the, the late onset form of Alzheimer's, is that uh, they can increase your risk, but they don't say definitively that you're gonna get the disease. And even if you have the gene, um, well, if you have the gene, it's not saying you're definitively, definitively going to get symptoms. If you don't have the gene, you're not necessarily safe either. That's why we, we really don't disclose this genetic result and we don't put too much stock in it. Um, it's simply a risk factor gene, which by the way, any, any of us can get from the um, mail-in uh, genetic testing services that are out there. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Cindy Armour says, thank you for such an important topic. There are so many sufferers. Um, I think you also touched on this, but Cindy Armour asks, are you are looking for participants? Um, and are you looking for volunteers who do not yet have symptoms of dementia? If you could address both of those. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. We've had such a, a really powerful response from the community. We, we have a lot of participants in the study already. We are still open as a study to new recruits and we're prioritizing people who come from groups that are traditionally less represented in research, especially African-Americans or people from Hispanic backgrounds or, um, or other uh, minority backgrounds. We would love to have individuals from those communities be a part of our study. And we already do have um, uh, quite a few. In the RAP study, we have over 200 African Americans in our study so far. And in our Alzheimer's Center, uh, we have about the same number. And uh, we're trying to double the number of people in our study from that community. And so we would really love for people who may be interested who are from a, a minority um, group to be a part of our study. Great, and I did post those links uh, in the chat. So feel free to reference those. I put the RAP link out there as well as the WAI link. So if you can find more information out there. Um, one final question um, regarding participants in the study again, do you share the level of tau also? We, uh... Right now we do not. And that's something that we're, we're continuing to watch and um, gather enough evidence so that we can start sharing that in the future. Right now we don't. And it's, it's just mainly because it's too new and we need to make sure that the signal that we're seeing is truly predicting cognitive change. As you saw, I think it is, but we just need to get enough evidence um, to, to make sure we can do it in a, in a way that's safe and helpful 
and, um, and meaningful for our participants. And I, I don't think it'll be too much longer before we start doing that. We so do, I, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, we, we do share um, cognitive change. Most people start to study cognitively normal if we're observing cognitive change and to the point where a person has mild impairment or dementia, we certainly work with them and their doctor on, on sharing that information. So I, I like to ask our speakers sort of like this kind of pie-eyed question. So, um, so bear with me here, but just, and, and no one will hold you to this, but if someone were to say, when will there be a cure for Alzheimer's disease? What would your answer be? That's a great question. Um, I think I would say that we will have an effective treatment um, for Alzheimer's disease in the next five years. Now, that's pretty soon, um, yeah. but there's now uh, half a dozen drugs in development that are showing that they can pull amyloid out of the brain. And oh. I think it's a matter of finding that sweet spot of when to give these drugs to stop that whole cascade of amyloid initiating tau and that eventually resulting in cognitive change. And I think, I think it's a matter of time. I think the drugs are there that may be very useful in slowing this disease down and stopping its progression. Now, whether it cures a person back to where they used to be, I think that's a much longer and more difficult challenge because the brain has a hard time growing new brain cells after they've been lost uh, to this disease. And after all that neurodegeneration has happened. So I'm not sure about that one, but I think our, our um, clinical trials are telling us that at least we will have an effective therapy to stop this disease, which is uh, really extraordinary. I think the next five years are going to be incredible for our field. That's really exciting news and a great way to wrap up our discussion with Dr. Sterling Johnson. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I know um, a lot of people are out here that are, are watching now and are gonna watch later, um, just really absorbing all of this important information and what it means for them and their families. So thanks so much for joining us, Sterling. Thank you, it's glad, I was glad to be here. So that wraps up our Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month, and we're going to be kicking off Sustainability Month in the month of July. We're going to uh, be back on air Tuesday, July 12th at noon, and we're going to be talking with assistant professors Jennifer Van Oss and Aaron Lashnitz, and they're going to be talking about the impact of climate change on animals and livestock. We usually hear the reverse, right, where uh, livestock are affecting climate and environment. And this is sort of going to be a little bit of a different discussion about how, how climate change is affecting them. Be sure to visit us at badgertalks.wist.edu. Um, you can check out our podcast uh, where Sterling actually recently talked with Ben. Uh, you can hear that interview. See our upcoming schedule of live talks. You can also sign up for our email list to be the first to learn about new talks coming up. Consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by grant funding. And then you can also search the roster of over 400 faculty and staff that are listed out on our website that have generously offered to give talks in communities like yours on important topics like this one today. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you again in July. Thanks.